Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on the Best of Oklahoma Gardening, we have more great grasses for the landscape. Host Casey Hinches looks at some perennials that will add beauty to your garden year after year. For areas with mature trees, we also have some shade-tolerant ornamental grasses. OSU turf grass specialist Justin Moss joins us to explain the biology used to identify grasses, and we cover the lawn with turf grass type ornamental grasses as well. some height into your landscape but aren't ready to commit to planting a small tree or small shrub, maybe you should think about considering planting perennial grasses. There are several that get several feet tall and will add that height into your landscape. One is this ravina grass that we have right here. You can see it averages out about 8 to 10 feet tall but once it starts blooming it can get up to 12 feet in height. Um, hardy to zone 5, this is often used as a substitute in colder climates as uh, the pampas grass and therefore it's often referred to as hardy pampas grass. Now it's got a little bit different of a, a plume than the pampas grass, it has a bit more of a narrow, sharper looking plume to it. I do have to add a word of caution, however, in Oklahoma and in southern climates, this plant can be invasive. And in fact, this is listed on Oklahoma's invasive plant list. So you can see here we have it planted in a very manicured, maintained landscape and it's been controlled. In that setting, it's okay, but if you're going to plant this anywhere else, you need to be very cautious and I would not recommend planting it in open areas where it can naturalize easily especially in moist areas where it can really take off and develop a monoculture stand that can um, prevent other grasses from growing and can even block waterways. Because we are in zones anywhere from six to seven, we can actually plant pampas grass. And so that would be one that I would recommend actually. This is uh, pampas grass here. You can see it has a little bit finer leaf blade to it, but it's a nice stately grass to add either individually, it will make a nice focal point, or you can plant it in a row and use it as a wind block. While most of them get to be about six feet tall, it's going to be the plumes that you're really after. That's really what it's desired for, as they almost look like feather dusters on top of the plant. Now most of them have either an ivory cream or white plume, but there is a cultivar called Pink Feathers that has a pink plume to it. Now most of these are only hardy to zone 7, but if you're in northern Oklahoma, there is a cultivar called Blue Bayou, which is hardy to zone 6. Coming down in size a little bit, we have several miscanthus grasses to choose from. There's miscanthus gracilimus, which is kind of the traditional, it's an oldie but goodie um, landscape plant. It's a green landscape plant that's similar to this, only it has a silver midrib in it. Um, and it's one that you'll often find all over towns and landscapes. Now there's also um, some that have a little bit more variegation to them. Uh, again, these maintain a three to five foot height on them. There's gold bar, which has more of an upright growth to it and has a variegation that runs perpendicular to the leaf blade and it has a yellow variegation to it. There's also one that has a bit more of a fountain habit to it and so it weeps a little bit but with a perpendicular white band across the leaf blade and that's known as zebra grass. Now if you would like the look of zebra grass but wanted to have more of an upright growth, look for a cultivar called porcupine or strictus um, and that's going to give you that upright growth but again with the perpendicular banding across that leaf. 
Here I'm standing by a cultivar called Morning Light, which is similar to Gracilimus, but it actually has a uh, variegation on the outside or the margins of the leaves. You can also see the leaves tend to be a little bit more narrow, and so as you look at it from a distance, it has just a nice kind of a, a golden yellow glow to the whole form and shape of the plant. Another mid-level popular ornamental grass is Calamagrostis or feathery grass. Um, one of the most popular cultivars is called Carl Forrester and this plant will get much taller. It'll get to be about three to five feet tall but you can see the plumes are a little bit more narrow um, and they have this nice kind of tannish bronze color to them that they'll exhibit midsummer through the rest of the season. Now this plant, it has more of a vertical appearance which really offers nice lines in the gardens versus the weeping nature of some of the other ornamental grasses. Now one thing all of those perennial grasses that we've talked about so far have in common is that they're all clumping grasses for the most part, which means when you plant them in the ground, they're pretty much going to stay right there in that same location. You might see a little bit of spreading or the growth of that clump, but it's where you plant it is where it's going to stay and you'll notice that foliage coming out of the base of that plant versus some spreading grasses. There are grasses that spread and what this means is they're actually going to travel by rhizomes across an area which allows that foliage to pop up and kind of create more of a mat of foliage. An example of a perennial uh, spreading grass is uh, blue lime grass. This is a popular grass that we have here and it actually is a cool season grass so you'll see most of its growth in the spring and in the fall but being hardy from zones 4 to 10 it's, it does quite well here in Oklahoma. Because it is a cool season grass you might want to look at a cultivar called blue dune which actually handles our heats just a little bit better. Um, this grass will get to be about three to five feet tall and as you can see kind of travel across the landscape. We had to come to our Japanese garden for our third spreading perennial ornamental grass and this is Japanese blood grass that's next to us here. Sometimes mistaken for purple fountain grass because of the red foliage on it but this is a perennial and a spreading grass um, and so it's not going to give you those big fountains that you would find on the purple fountain grass. Now again I have to give a word of caution about this plant. The straight genus species Imperata cylindrica is actually listed on the federal noxious weed list. Now that does not include the cultivars Rubra or Red Baron, which are sold in the horticulture trade and are noted for having the red tips on their foliage. The straight genus species is a green uh, plant and there is some concern about whether this uh, cultivar will it's noted as being not invasive, that it doesn't spread, that it's less aggressive, and that it won't reseed. However, that is not backed by any data. And so I would say, if you see this reverting or reseeding in your landscape, you want to remove it immediately. Because this plant is hardy from zones 5 to 9, it's even more of a concern about its invasive qualities in the south from Texas to Florida up into the Carolinas. Um, some states such as Alabama have gone so far to even make it illegal for the owning, the selling, and even sharing of the horticulture cultivar rubra. All of these grasses that we've mentioned are perennial ornamental grasses, which means they're relatively easy to maintain in order to get them to come back year after year. All you're going to do is in late February, early March, you're going to want to prune back all of the foliage, um, which at that point would have died. You're going to prune that back to as low as you can on the crown of that plant typically around six to eight inches. Now depending on some of these larger clumps of grasses that can be a little difficult but you want to get that as tight as possible so that when that new growth starts coming out you're going to have a nice fountain grass effect and not have to see any of that remaining dead foliage. Now you want to leave that foliage through the winter months because one it adds some nice height to our landscape that can often look flat in the winter time. 
Also, it provides nice cover for wildlife and it will help uh, kind of mulch and, and blanket that uh, grass through those winter months, especially on something that might be a little bit marginally hardy, such as the pampas grass. It can be a tricky situation to plant grass in a shady environment such as under a tree, but there are a few grasses that can handle these shady environments. And one of those is northern sea oats or inland sea oats um, that we have here. This is Chasmanthium latifolium, and you can see it gets to a nice height of two to three feet. And what's neat about this plant is it ha offers a unique um, seed head that has these kind of flat, uh, fish-like. It's also called fish on a pole because it tends to look like fish dangling from a fishing pole. Now, although this is native to eastern United States, it can be an aggressive reseeder because these seeds are viable, so you want to be aware of that. But a way to control those seeds from growing is to simply cut those back and enjoy the foliage. These seed heads that you cut off, you can actually put those panicles into cut flower arrangements and they offer a nice kind of texture to those arrangements. Now what makes this even a tougher plant is the fact that you can plant it even under a black walnut tree. We also have another shade tolerant ornamental grass that can handle being planted under a black walnut and that's Japanese forest grass that you can see here. It kind of has a uh, more of a bamboo like texture in its foliage that weeps over which really makes it nice for the front of your garden and even it works really well in container gardens to kind of drape over those uh, pots, the edge of the pots. Now this um, grass can get kind of a, a lime green in heavier shade, but you do want to make sure to kind of incorporate it into a heavier shade in southern climates and in Oklahoma um, because it really prefers to have that break from our summer heat. Another alternative for you to use in the shade is blue fescue. Now unlike chasmanthium, this is anything but aggressive. In fact, this plant is just going to stay where you put it. It really is actually considered a short-lived perennial um, in Oklahoma. And in hot, humid environments like we have here in Oklahoma, you might find it actually has some dieback on its foliage. Now, the other thing here, I think the reason why we've been somewhat lucky with our little stand here is because it is in a raised bed. This plant cannot tolerate wet soils and you will quickly see it die if you do put it in wet soils. While this plant can be somewhat fussy, once you have found its ideal location, it's going to offer you these nice tan seed heads that rise above this lovely blue clump of grass and really is a nice alternative for the shade garden. Now, if none of these have really struck your fancy, there are a few other options, but the ones that we've mentioned here are true grasses in the Poaceae family. Stay tuned as we explore more options of ornamental grasses that aren't really true grasses. So what makes a grass a grass? So here we are with a bunch of beautiful turf grasses and ornamental grasses, and then there's a lot of plants that look like grasses but actually are not. So how would we look at these and ID these to know if it's actually grass? Well, what we do as horticulturalists and turf scientists and landscape managers is we'll take a look at some specific features of the plant and that'll help us to know, okay, is this a grass or not? But also it'll help us to know which species are we dealing with? And so basically what we do is we'll go out to the field or wherever we're working and when we're trying to ID something, we'll just take a sample. And the nice thing about that is you got the plant in your hand, you can take a look at it. The bad thing about it is sometimes it's very small and hard to see. So often what we'll do is we'll magnify it up, take a look with magnification so that we can see these features. So one of the first things that we'll actually look for, I'll back up a second, and we'll just kind of look at the landscape itself. And so sometimes we can see maybe different shades. And so I'm standing in an area right here where I actually see three different shades of grass. One's a little darker green, one's a little lighter green, and then one's even more darker green back here, and they all have different textures. So when we talk about maybe the leaf itself, we define that in terms of a texture. So if we have a very skinny, leaf blade, we'll say it has a fine texture. 
If we have a more wide or fat leaf blade, we'll say it has a coarse texture. So we can see here, just right here where I'm standing, differences from a medium to a fine to a coarse textured grass here. So that can help us to know, okay, which, which direction should I go then? The other thing we can look at, just looking at the field here, is are there any inflorescence, or an easier word for that or term for that is a seed head. So we can look around and try to find out, are there any seed heads here? And so there actually are, and I can pull up a, a Bermuda grass seed head, and I can see it comes up and has three or four or five little fingers sticking out. Or if I had a zoysia grass seed head, it would just be a single spike sticking up out of the ground. Or if I had maybe like a Kentucky bluegrass seed head, it would look more, uh, it would be a panicle and be more like a triangle with flowers sticking out from it. So that can definitely help us. Okay, so let's get a little bit closer and magnify and look at this. So I have a Bermuda grass sample in my hand. And so after I'm looking at the texture, the seed heads or inflorescence, I'll, I'll take a closer look at my sample and I'll just kind of peel the a leaf back and take a look at the junction where there's a stem coming up and then if I pull the leaf back I'll notice as it pulls back it has a sheath or covering and that sheath or covering covers the stem and as I pull it back that sheath or covering comes off and then I can look at that junction there and I can look for specific features like a ligule so a ligule is, could be right there at that junction where I pull the leaf sheath back from the stem and I point it up and take a look and I may see some hairs there. So a lot of times on Bermuda grass you'll see a fringe of hairs for the ligule. There's other grasses that you actually see what looks like a little piece of skin and we'll say that's a membranous ligule. Okay, so the other thing I do is where I pulled that back is look at the, actually the back side of the leaf and just like my shirt here has a collar on it, I can look at the back side of that leaf and look for the collar. And sometimes that could be really nothing there, just nothing to see. Or you could see maybe a, a broad area of meristematic tissue, which makes it look maybe white and, and very broad. And we'll say it has a broad collar or something like that, where you may not see anything. But that can help us to ID. So for Bermuda grass, you don't see a whole lot on the collar area. Okay. So now, if I just look at the leaf itself, I was talking about the leaf texture. So this is kind of a skinny or fine leaf texture, but also I can look at, are there veins running up and down the leaves? Is it venous or not? And, and then can I look at the leaf tip? Does it come to a point or is it rounded or is it blunt? Or does it look like the bow of a boat? So that can really help me. For Bermuda grass, it's gonna be usually a pointed leaf tip. But if I'm dealing with the bluegrass, it's gonna look like the bow of a boat. So, so that can really help us to differentiate. So um, the other thing I can do is actually, if I were to take this stem here and just take a, a straight edge and just chop that stem right in half, and then I take a, a turn it towards myself and, and look down at like I'm looking down a barrel or something like that, I can actually see something called uh, vernation. And so sometimes these, it's, it's, it's the way that basically these stems in, in uh, the plant itself grows up as a stem. And sometimes that's more flattened or folded is what we'll call it. And sometimes it's more round like a roll of paper towels or rolled. And so you can look and see, does my grass have a folded vernation or a rolled vernation? And actually that sometimes can help you say like with a Bermuda grass versus a zoysia grass where one has folded and one is rolled. All difficult things to master, but once you kind of do it a time or two, it becomes quite easier. The other thing we have at Oklahoma State University is we have actually courses to help you ID grasses, not just for the students here at Stillwater, but also for the public. So uh, we have extension, uh, county extension offices where they can help you ID these grasses. But what's nice about it, get some of these tools in your toolbox, you can go out and press your friends and press your husband or wife and say, hey, I know what this is and I know how the ID features are for grasses. So when we think about ornamental grasses in our garden, we usually think about big, beautiful, tall, flowing, 
uh, swaying in the wind, beautiful plants. But also, if we think about it, our lawns under our feet also have beautiful ornamental grasses that kind of lay down that baseline or that palette for your backyard or your garden. And so in Oklahoma, we can grow several different types of turf grasses for our lawn. One of those that's probably the most popular in Oklahoma is Bermuda grass. And so Bermuda grass is actually a species that was introduced to the United States. And so it's not native to Oklahoma. However, it is ubiquitous to Oklahoma. It is everywhere. And so almost anywhere you go in Oklahoma, you're going to find Bermuda grass. So it is well adapted to our environment. And actually, a lot of the uh, grasses that are sold and marketed as sod or even as seed around Oklahoma, Bermuda grass is going to be the top seller. And even at Oklahoma State University, we have a breeding program where we develop new and improved Bermuda grasses that do quite well in many conditions, including some for your lawn. So another nice warm season grass, we mentioned Bermuda grass earlier, but another one that's actually native to Oklahoma is buffalo grass. And so buffalo grass is a nice Oklahoma grass being that it is one of the uh, few native grasses that we can actually use as a turf grass. Now the trick here is it's got a little bit different use than uh, the Bermuda grass we mentioned earlier. Now both of these want to be in the full sun and, and they don't like shade very much. But if you're out in the full sun, it can be nice choices. The thing about a buffalo grass lawn is it has that native look to it. And you can also intermix it with other native grasses if you choose. And actually that's originally what they did here at the Welcome Center at Oklahoma State University. And so this grass will spread through stolons and fill in areas. The thing about it though is, is if you have a little bit of Bermuda grass and buffalo grass in the same area and they're competing, oftentimes the Bermuda grass will just win out, especially if you're irrigating, fertilizing, and things like that. So one of the keys is make sure all the Bermuda grass or other grasses for that matter are completely removed before you go in with a nice native planting of buffalo grass. Here in the Oklahoma shade, another great turf grass for us is tall fescue. Now the reason that we grow this in the shade is it is a shade tolerant turf grass. And some of our other grasses like Bermuda grass or buffalo grass do not grow well at all in the shade. So oftentimes you'll see a multi-species or at least two species growing in, in a lawn if you have a lot of shade. So here we have tall fescue. Oftentimes it is also kind of mixed in with another Oklahoma turf grass that can be used, Kentucky bluegrass. However, the caveat is for most of the state, if we're going to use tall fescue or tall fescue blended with Kentucky bluegrass, really the shade is about our only option for that. And shade is a relative term, right? And so we have to think about, well, how much shade are we getting? If it's a heavy, dense shade, maybe no grasses are going to grow. And you need to think about alternatives such as uh, shade tolerant perennials or even hardscapes. But if you have some light coming through, and these are big trees here and we have a nice stand growing, it can do quite well for you as a nice shade grass in Oklahoma. So here's an Oklahoma turf grass that can do well in the full sun or in the partial shade, and this is zoysia grass. The nice thing about zoysia grass is it's very tough, hardy grass for Oklahoma. So the difference with zoysia grass and say a tall fescue or tall fescue Kentucky bluegrass blend is that with the cool season grasses, the tall fescue Kentucky bluegrass, it can grow well in the shade, but not as well in the full sun in most of Oklahoma. However, zoysia grass, it loves the sun. It'll do quite well and again, can tolerate that partial shade. And with the zoysia grass, it can grow from stolons, from sprigs, and through rhizomes underground. So you can purchase sod or plugs, or even there is some zoysia grasses you can buy a, a seed for it too. But what I would recommend is it's a little bit slower growing. So if you're gonna go with zoysia grass, I'd recommend go, just go ahead and sodding, just because you have that instant law and instant establishment. You can plug it, just be aware it's gonna take a little while. So in the southern part of the state, we can also grow another Oklahoma turf grass, St. Augustine grass. Now the reason I say the southern part of the state is St. Augustine grass does not have 
the cold tolerance as some of the other turf grasses. And so if we keep it closer to the southern part of Oklahoma, it can overwinter quite well. Now St. Augustine grass is going to have a coarser leaf texture or a wider leaf blade, but it's very popular across Texas and southern Oklahoma, can do quite well. So while your beautiful ornamental grasses can make a great border or a great addition to your landscape, don't forget about the ornamental turf grasses for your great lawn, for your backyards, for your front yards. A nice place to play, to relax, and just to enjoy the outdoors. Next week we will have a show filled with bugs and birds. There will be great information on bees, winter care for birds, butterflies, and using fire to restore wildlife habitats. Until then, we wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.